Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Duff from the Supreme Court Historical Society. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you all today to a wonderful lecture we have in store from Professor Randy Barnett and Evan Burnick. They will be joining us shortly and uh, we will begin uh, our session and uh, welcome you all there. Thank you very much. For both of us? Yeah, it should sound okay. I mean, you couldn't use the handheld mic while I use the level there. Um, they, they can't both go into the same receiver. Okay, sorry. All right, do you hear us okay? I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Say, say, hold on a second, say something. Frank Court Historical Society. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome you today to the virtual conversation delivered by longtime friends of the Lee Society, Randy Barnett and Evan Burnett. Well, I know there are many of us who would love to have this fine program uh, done in person. We are delighted that we were able to gather the professors virtually to discuss their engaging new book on the origins of the 14th Amendment. Professors Barnett and Burnett are going to talk for about 40 minutes. They will then pause to the members of our virtual audience. Should you have a question or a comment on their, their lecture, you can send those via the Q and A feature on your Zoom. Jim Duff will review your comments and pass them along to our two speakers. About our speakers today, Professor Randy Barnett is the Patrick Potoon Professor of Constitutional Law at Georgetown University Law Center. He's also the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. He has graced the uh, society's lectern several times pre previously, the most recent being in 2018, when he engaged in a conversation with Professor Richard Primus. Along with Professor Primus, um, Professor Barnett was the inaugural Guggenheim Fellow in Constitution Studies in 2007. Professor Burnick is an assistant professor of law at Northern Illinois University. Previously, he was a visiting professor at Georgetown and the executive director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Before that, he served as a clerk to Judge Diane Sykes of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. From April 2017 until April of 2019, he was a visiting lecturer at Georgetown and a resident fellow of the Center for the Constitution. I'm delighted to welcome these two staunch friends of the society. And for those of you in the audience, I think you are in for a real treat. Welcome, professors. And the floor is now yours. Thank you for sharing with us today. Well, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful and gracious introduction. Uh, let me just make sure before I say any more that you can hear me okay. I see one person, I see somebody nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, anyway, it's Evan and my great pleasure to be here to talk about our new book, The Original Meaning of the 14th Amendment, um, Its Letter and Spirit. The 14th Amendment has to be the most important amendment that most people have never heard of. I actually, as a law professor, was somewhat unaware of how uh, uh, oblivious the general public was to the 14th Amendment until this book was published. And I find that I have to begin every discussion about the book with telling people exactly what the 14th Amendment is. Uh, but let me begin by just saying uh, why it's the most important amendment you've never heard of. Um, and, and that is because virtually any challenge to a state law on the basis of the First Amendment freedom of speech, um, freedom of assembly, free exercise of religion, or the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms 
any challenge to a state law on the basis of those rights is actually a 14th Amendment challenge. Why? Because the first 10 amendments that we know call the Bill of Rights uh, did not originally apply to the states under our original framework. And it was the 14th Amendment, as we show in our book, that changed that uh, and made the rights, the fundamental rights that are enumerated in the Constitution, as well as other fundamental privileges or immunities of citizens um, applicable to the states, both in court, both in federal court, and by empowering Congress to pass civil rights laws to enforce these privileges or immunities when states fail to do so. So that's the reason why every First Amendment challenge you feed to a state and every Second Amendment challenge you feed to a state is really a 14th Amendment challenge. So that's the very important reason. That's the re reason why the 14th Amendment uh, is so important. Uh, the other reason why it's of significance and why it's a shame that people don't know about it um, is that most people are familiar with the 13th Amendment, and if they don't know it by the number, they'll know it when you tell them what it is. It is the amendment uh, passed by the Republicans in Congress to abolish slavery in the United States. Prior to that, slavery was legal at the option of states, um, and it, the federal government lacked any power uh, to prohibit slavery uh, in any state where it currently where it then existed. But the 13th Amendment changed that. So the 13th Amendment was there to abolish slavery. What happened in the wake of the abolition of slavery was contrary to the expectations of those who opposed slavery. Those who opposed slavery and then those who fought in the Civil War um, assumed that once slavery was abolished, then African Americans, free blacks, would be able to assume their proper role as citizens of the United States and be afforded all the privileges or immunities that such citizens would receive. And all that would be necessary would be to abolish slavery. But that proved not to be the case, tragically. Um, what happened was in the southern states, in, who had formed the basis of the resistance, um, uh, a new resistance movement um, engaged in uh, armed terrorism against the freedmen and against anyone who would come to the freedmen's aid arose in these southern states. Uh, and every attempt was made by enacting what were called black codes to reduce the freedmen um, to essentially their level, their previous level of servitude in all but name. The Republicans in Congress did not take this lightly. And what they did, in addition, they passed a, a very important civil rights law, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which both uh, declared that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and also guaranteed certain enumerated privileges that were listed in that statute. And then they did something more. They amended the Constitution to fight white supremacy, uh, the organized movement for white supremacy that, that, that was begun and continued in the southern states. They had a constitutional amendment to fight and to combat this white supremacy, and that amendment was the 14th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, which was the scourge of the country up until it was enacted. And then the 14th Amendment was designed to combat white supremacy, um, which became the scourge of this country from the moment that slavery ended until very, very recently in our history, or at least into the 20th century. Uh, because very sad to say, the 14th Amendment, which was enacted to protect the privileges or immunities of all citizens of the United States, as well as to guarantee the due process of law to all persons and the equal protection of the law to all persons. Sadly, that amendment was gutted by the Supreme Court, beginning in an 1873 case known as the Slaughterhouse Cases, which I actually lectured in front of the Supreme Court Historical Society about a few years ago, um, and up through uh, additional cases known as the Civil Rights Cases, United States versus Cruikshank, eventually Plessy versus Ferguson. And through all these Supreme Court decisions, the 14th Amendment was essentially gutted. This amendment that was designed uh, specifically to uh, end or to combat the white supremacy movement that had arisen in the South. But that, with that amendment gone, uh, as we all know, Jim Crow, um, the regime of white, the regime of legal white supremacy in the South, lasted another uh, 90 years until it was finally uh, first questioned in Brown versus Board of Education in 1952 and really was combated effectively by the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Ironically, or 
again, tragically, the Republicans in Congress passed their own Civil Rights Act in 1875, which prohibited discrimination um, in the provision of public accommodations throughout the country, not just in the South. Um, and they did so using their Section 5 powers of the 14th Amendment to enforce their Section 1 powers, which were the Privileges or Immunities Clause and the other clauses in Section 1. When, because of the precedents established by the Supreme Court that essentially gutted the 14th Amendment, when the 14th, when uh, Congress came around 90 years later to passing another Civil Rights Act protecting uh, African Americans and all persons from discrimination with respect to public accommodations in 1964, they had to do so, or they thought they had to do so, using their commerce power rather than their Section 5 enforcement powers under the 14th Amendment. And that brings us up to today. And at this point, why don't I uh, turn it over to my co-author to, uh, to add uh, some more uh, stories about uh, uh, the, what the 14th Amendment is uh, and why it's important. Evan? Well, thank you, Randy, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. It is indeed an honor to be here with you all. Um, Andy has given an excellent account of the specific claims that we make about the enactment of the 14th Amendment and the kinds of changes that it was designed to effectuate within American law. And I'm going to take the opportunity to zoom out a bit and just talk a bit about what we see as the importance of our discoveries, the importance of this project in light of the fact that literally thousands of pages have already been spent, including by a constitutional originalist trying to discover the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. What is the point of telling this story, revisiting this history again today? The 14th Amendment um, is proof positive that it is possible working within our constitutional system uh, for a mass political movement that swept the entire country to go from a beleaguered minority to capturing all three branch, well, two branches of the federal governments and enacting a scheme that was designed to achieve liberation rather than domination. A slaveholder's republic was smashed at the height of its power by abolitionists, by Republicans who followed in their footsteps to make dramatic changes to the distribution of power between the federal government and the states to ensure black liberation and the protection of allies of enslaved and freed black people who were, as Randy talks about, subjugated both before the Civil War and in the wake of the Civil War under the auspices of the black codes. The story that we tell is not a story that has happy endings all around, far from it. In fact, as Randy has already suggested, the story of the Supreme Court's intervention to effectively gut Reconstruction through the uh, slaughterhouse cases and through the civil rights cases of 1883 um, that held unconstitutional beyond Congress's powers, the protection of black people against discrimination in places of public accommodation is a tragic legacy. However, there was for several years a brief moment in time when what W.E.B. Du Bois referred to as abolition democracy was effectuated by Congress, by the executive branch, and by non-governmental institutions that sought to protect uh, the physical freedom, the economic freedom, and the political freedom of Black people and to integrate them, incorporate them, into our social order in ways that they had been deliberately excluded from previously. Our story is one that is you know, saturated by pain and the blood of martyrs, but it is also one that testifies to the resilience of the human spirit and the possibility of libertary politics in this country. It is one that says that genetics in the sense of the protections for slavery that were built into the 1788 constitution are not destiny in terms of our politics today. Within our constitutional system, change is possible that can transform domination into liberation, that can ensure that people of all colors and creeds um, can live under the equally protected civil rights, free from violence, free from depredation, whether it comes from states or from private actors whose states are systematically failing to protect against violence. 
So beyond the specific claims that we make about original meaning, which are distinctive from other originalists and other people who, uh, the, and the claims of other scholars that have engaged the subjects, um, we're making a larger argument about the possibility of liberatory politics in America. And the history that we tell is not just told in order uh, to change in important ways the way that the Supreme Court protects our liberties, although it is designed to do precisely that, but to honor the sacrifices of countless people, both known to history and unknown, um, that embedded an instrument that was designed to break white supremacy into our constitution, a constitution um, that allowed human bondage to take place in the states, even though many of the framers hoped that slavery would effectu effectively peter out. They were wrong about that. Constitutional change was needed in order um, to make good on the promises of the Declaration of Independence. And things could have gone very differently, very easily. Um, we tend to look right now at the antebellum period and see the slave power, you know, the, the organized forces that were designed, that, uh, that calculated to capture all three branches of, of the federal governments and effectively create the rights on the part of slaveholders to travel with enslaved people into different states, making this truly in every respect a slaveholders republic. We look at that as if it couldn't possibly have worked. It was on its way out. And the imperialist ambitions of slaveholders and their allies today just look like fever dreams. They look completely absurd. At the time, there was a very real possibility recognized by President Lincoln that the Supreme Court would bless an arrangement whereby as a matter of constitutional due process, every slaveholder could travel to every state in the country, not just federal territories, and bring slavery into that jurisdiction. Um, slaveholders had imperial ambitions that involved taking over other lands and spreading slavery into them, making the United States into a slaveholding republic that slaveholders regarded as cutting edge in the same way that racially stratified labor in Brazil and other colonialist empires were. It was only thanks to this mass political movement that Randy and I document that changed how people understood citizenship, which in turn uh, led to the ascendance of the Republican Party, that that fate was averted. And we got a 14th Amendment that was designed to deliver on the Declaration's promises. This is all contingent. It's all up to us. And this story that we tell is one about the possibility of that kind of radical change under our constitutional system. I want to say a few words about originalism, what originalism is, and why this project is so important to originalism. But before I do, given what Evan, where Evan just left off, um, I'm wondering if he can tell us a little bit more before I do that about what the anti-slavery movement's conception of national citizenship was and how the Republicans picked up that notion and developed it and eventually embodied this into the text of the Constitution in the form of the Citizenship Clause mm -hmm. and the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Abolitionists had a conception of citizenship which held that all citizens of the United States, as citizens of the United States, were entitled to certain civil rights that had proven their worth as means of securing the natural liberty that people gain or that, that is preserved when people enter into society from the hypothetical state of nature. Basically, tried and true civil liberties, right to, uh, right to a trial by jury, habeas corpus, um, the right to own and acquire property, the re right to be free from interpersonal violence. These rights, abolitionists argue, came with citizenship they were good in every part of the country, and they traveled with people. This idea came to be associated with a particular clause of the Constitution, the antebellum Constitution, called the Privileges and Immunities Clause. The Privileges and Immunities Clause promised to, uh, promises to citizens of the states the ability to enjoy privileges and immunities when they travel to other states. Abolitionists, took this not just as a promise of interstate comedy, you go to another state, you'll be treated just like citizens of that state, but an absolute baseline guarantee of protection for fundamental rights no matter where you went. And the importance of that kind of national citizenship only became heightened as slaveholders became more committed to ensuring 
that their property, as they understood it, was protected absolutely everywhere. And people who spoke out, who denied um, human bondage, denied that the Declaration tolerated it, denied even that the antebellum Constitution tolerated it, um, they argued that we needed a citizenship. We had a citizenship that prevent that protected enslaved people, that protected free black people, that protected abolitionists from getting mobbed, shot, otherwise persecuted, even in the northern states. It was aspirational in certain regards. Certainly that kind of freedom was not consistently enjoyed in the South at all. But that aspiration was one that the Republican Party eventually took up and said, look, we are going to embed what we believe that the Constitution always did explicitly in the Constitution. We are going to say, beyond any doubt, beyond the you know, whims of any future Congress, that every citizen of the United States, everyone who is born or naturalized as a citizen of the United States, enjoys certain fundamental rights that go with them that cannot be taken away by any states that are central to their natural liberty and also to their civic equality. The Privileges or Immunities Clause, we argue, uh, Randy and I, doesn't just guarantee a baseline of fundamental rights, including some that are enumerated in the Constitution and some are not. It protects people against arbitrary discrimination with respect to their enjoyment of those rights. It's not enough just that everybody has them. If a state is arbitrarily making distinctions between people, that offends the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So let me just say what the Privileges or Immunities Clause uh, says. It says, mm -hmm. no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Let me say that again because it sounds like it would be very really important. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And yet, from 1868 and to this day, um, that clause has been rendered a non-entity, a nobody. Nobody can go into court today uh, and, and expect to win a cause of action by asserting the Privileges or Immunities Clause because of the slaughterhouse cases in, in, 17, uh, in 1873. Um, the clause has only made two appearances in the Supreme Court in a favorable way since then. Um, this is the most important clause. It is the heart of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. Um, and this is the, and it's the original meaning of this clause, plus the original meaning of the due process of law clauses and the equal protection of law clauses that follow that, that we attempt to um, uh, establish uh, in our book. So maybe at this point, I could talk a little bit about originalism. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're finished with what you were saying about this. I'm absolutely finished. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, we are both originalists. Uh, many of you uh, are aware of originalism. Many of you may have some preconceptions about what originalism is. Let me give you a one sentence definition of what originalism is. It is the proposition that the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. That's all that originalism is. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. In this case, the meaning of the Constitution was properly changed by the 14th Amendment. So then the question is, what is the original meaning of that amendment? Now, one of the reasons why originalism is held uh, or is viewed skeptically uh, by many is because uh, it made a, an appearance of a sort uh, in Brown versus Board of Education when the Supreme Court asked the parties to brief what might sound like original, originalism um, and that specifically what they asked the parties to brief was whether the framers of the 14th Amendment would have expected uh, that amendment to have abolished discrimination with respect to public schools. Um, in other words, what was the original intended expectation or the original expected application, sorry, what was the original expectations of the people that wrote and ratified the, uh, of the Constitution with respect to public schools? And the historians that they were asked to brief this, uh, this question came back with their opinion about this, which the Supreme Court took to be, in its words, in the words of Chief Justice uh, Warren, inconclusive. Well, people have taken inconclusive actually to mean not so good for originalism, uh, because the argument was that most people didn't expect 
the 14th Amendment would lead to the desegregation or justify the desegregation of schools. But in our book, what our book is in the tradition of is in the tradition of modern originalism, which is not looking for the intentions of the framers and the expectations that they may have had as to how their handiwork would be applied. What our book is looking at is what modern originalists look at, which is the original public meaning of the text. What was the original meaning of the words in the Constitution that should remain the same until they're properly changed by amendment? That was not a question that the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education asked the parties to brief. And therefore, they actually didn't get any answer to that question. Nowhere in Brown versus Board of Education or in any of the briefs to the court in Brown versus Board of Education was anyone asked what was the original meaning of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Um, and so they didn't get an answer to that question. Um, and we provide that answer in our question. So not only does the scholarship that we present um, provide a, a more robust picture of what the 14th Amendment was supposed to do and what it should be doing to this day, but it also provides, in some sense, a vindication or justification or a legitimation of originalism itself, uh, because it suggests that an appropriate approach to originalism uh, would have no problem with the outcome of Brown versus Board of Education and many other civil rights um, uh, decisions, some of which have been grounded on the wrong clauses of the Constitution, like the Due Process Clause or the Equal Protection Clause, or, or have been justified by Congress's use of the commerce power beyond its original meaning. But regardless, the results of many of these cases can be justified and should be justified on the basis of the original meaning of the Constitution. And that is what our book is about, and that's why it's called the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, its letter and its spirit. So I'm just wondering if we want to go to some kind of questions now, or I mean, Evan and I can talk about the book all day, um, but I just don't know if it was time if, uh, to uh, to get some questions. I, I think now would be a good time to welcome questions. And I, I know uh, we have a good audience today and uh, uh, happy to receive questions. Uh, uh, I will read them as we receive them and as, um, uh, but we're also getting responses. They like you talking, so you feel free to keep going if you, <laughs> if you like. Um, well, uh, you I, well, so go, go ahead, Evan. Answer what Randy has already said about originalism is that originalists have long been criticized. We think basically fairly for neglecting the 14th amendments in their efforts to seek to determine the original meaning of the constitution they haven't neglected it entirely in fact one of the leading works if not the leading uh, work of early originalism was raul berger's government by judiciary and it's all about the 14th amendment the thing is that Raoul Berger argued that the 14th Amendment really didn't do very much. And a lot of the claims that he made about the historical record were demonstrably false. This was not an isolated example of early originalist engagement with the 14th Amendment. It was sporadic and it wasn't particularly good. Originalism is only now starting to really recover from this decades of neglect of the reconstruction of methods, thanks to the work of scholars like Michael Kent Curtis and Akhil Lamar and Kurt Lash and Elon Werman and others who have focused attention again on the 14th Amendment and sought to uncover this history in ways that are more objective, more careful in dealing with primary sources and more friendly, for lack of putting a better word, not designed to emphasize the degree to which the 14th Amendment really didn't change very much, but open to the possibility that it did make dramatic changes in the constitutional structure and honestly reckoning with that. That's taken a lot of time to make its way into federal judicial opinions engaging with the 14th Amendment, but there is a particularly noticeable, uh, notable example that Randy and I talk a great deal about, and that is Clarence Thomas's concurrence in McDonald v. City of Chicago, which is absolutely saturated with the history of Reconstruction, 
and acknowledges the degree to which that history informed the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, rather than taking the view that the 14th Amendment didn't make any dramatic changes. More of that, please. Randy and I call for more of that, please. More efforts to spend time with the history of Rand Reconstruction, the, time, the history of the antebellum contestation over slavery in, in engaging with and inquiring into the meaning of rights that are so-called incorporated against the states by the 14th Amendment. It's quite possible that quite a few of those rights changed over the course of the antebellum period as people began to recognize that they were able to do, uh, circumstances called for different kinds of protections, and the meaning of rights changed from 1791 to 1868 in important ways. So what Randy and I are trying to do is make up for a lot of lost time and redirect attention on the part of not just original scholars in general and judges who are interested in doing, uh, doing justice to this history of contestation efforts of those who transformed our republic um, to really reckon with the nature of those changes rather than pretending that they didn't exist. And let me, um, uh, ample, let me, let me extend those remarks. Um, uh, by talking about the narrative of our constitutional history. Um, those of us who are originalists and those of us who love this country and those of us who actually like the Constitution, I'm the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution uh, because we actually think the Constitution is a good thing. Um, we spend an awful lot of our time talking about the founding, uh, the founders, the founder, the founding, the framers, um, and the founding generation. And I believe that um, uh, these, uh, that many of the founding are in some sense being unjustly impugned uh, by recent narratives. But nevertheless, however unjustly or unfairly some of them are being treated, it is absolutely undeniable that the sin, uh, the original sin of slavery um, existed at the time of the founding. It was begun, it had begun to be abolished in, in, in roughly half the states of the country. Uh, but it was preserved in the other half of the states of the country. Um, and if we're to only judge the merits of our constitution and our constitutional history and our legacy on the basis of that moment in time, you can understand why it would, it would be judged badly or harshly. But our constitutional history did not end at the founding. It proceeded. Uh, it proceeded to use the, 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 um, the framework, <coughs> excuse me, that was provided by the original constitution. And the principles that were embodied in the Declaration of Independence, even before the Constitution, to create a movement uh, to liberate enslaved people um, uh, that ultimately culminated in the formation of three political parties, first the Liberty Party, then the Free Soil Party, and finally the Republican Party. And it was the election of the Republican Party with its anti-slavery platform that drove the South out of the Union even before they could take office. But while they were in while the South had left and while they were in office, they immediately moved to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia to make sure that any new states um, that entered into the into the into the uh, the United States would be would have anti-slavery provisions uh, in their constitutions and a whole host of other uh, civil rights measures, uh, culminating in the Thirteenth Amendment, which finally and formally changed our Constitution uh, so that it would end the evil of slavery. But then also the 14th Amendment, which was specifically designed to deal with the organized terrorist white supremacist movement that arose in this country um, and which dogged this country for almost another hundred years thereafter. Uh, in other words, our constitutional history did not begin and end at the founding. It proceeded on. And if you take the whole of our constitutional history, you're going to find it not one of um, complete and total triumph, but certainly it's a history of progress, substantial and significant progress, both in the letter of our written constitution and then eventually, at long last, in our actual legal practices under the letter of the constitution. Thank, thank you both very much. Uh, and then we could listen uh, to more lecture um, all day, in, in my opinion. We are getting a lot of questions and I want to get to some of those. Um, for you, uh, for, for our listeners. 
Um, how would first, uh, how would searching for the original understanding of the terms affect the Commerce Clause power? Is that approach consistent with Gibbons versus Ogden? Well, our book is not about the Commerce Clause. Uh, so I've written quite a bit about the Commerce Clause. Um, and I, and I've written quite a bit about the original meaning of the Commerce Clause. And there really is no doubt uh, that navigation uh, was included within the powers of Congress, either because navigation was, a, was part of the original meaning of commerce or uh, because the regulation of nav navigation was so closely related uh, to interstate commerce and international commerce that, it be, that that power was considered to be incidental and therefore necessary and proper to the regulation of commerce. But on either account, uh, Givens versus Ogden is not a problematic case uh, for the original meaning of the commerce power. We don't discuss this at all in this book, uh, but the implications of our book is that an over expanded uh, interpretation of the commerce power, which is oftentimes justified as necessary to provide Congress with power to protect civil rights, uh, is not necessary to provide Congress with power to protect civil rights. Why? Because there are at least two civil rights amendments in the Constitution, the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment. And both of those contain separate enumerated powers in Congress to enforce the civil rights of all American citizens and to protect all persons in the United States uh, from having their life, liberty, or property uh, taken away from them uh, without the due process of law. Really the most vivid example of this is uh, the, the litigation strategy or the, um, the constitutional strategy that was taken by advocates of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in recognition of how the Supreme Court had interpreted the 14th Amendment. So let's break that down. Civil rights cases in 1883 hold that Congress only has the ability to respond to state action that violates people's civil rights and discrimination that takes the form of state action. Therefore, the case holds uh, places of public accommodation, discrimination in places of public accommodation, Congress can't reach that kind of discrimination. So there was an internal debate recognizing that constitutional challenges would come to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as to how to frame this piece of legislation. Frame it as a means of enforcing the 14th Amendment and you risk invalidation because you have this precedent that says, you can't reach that with this. You need some different tool. And lo and behold, the Supreme Court had in prior decades interpreted the Commerce Clause to provide exactly the requisite all encompassing power that was needed in order to secure the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But even proponents of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 were internally divided because they recognized that this wasn't really fundamentally about commerce. This was about racial discrimination and the evils thereof. And in order to you know, truly do justice, constitutional justice to what was going on here, we ought to recognize that this was an effort ultimately to enforce the 14th Amendment, its full promise, not the redacted version that the Supreme Court gave us by saying that Congress's Section 5 powers can't reach private act. So we don't get to you, what you end up with is a Congress that demonstrably has much more power to reach not only state action, but even under certain circumstances, state inaction than existed at the founding. But we argue that this isn't an abandonment of federalism. It is a recalibrating of it in recognition of the fact that the balance between federal and state power was recognized to be off uh, to the point where we had a literal war in order to recalibrate it. So things have changed dramatically. We acknowledge that. Um, we're, uh... This next question, uh, I'll just go down in order. And what I'm thinking, we're getting a lot of questions and a lot of interaction here, which is wonderful. Um, and, and we welcome this. I don't know that we're going to be able to get to all of the questions. And what I'd like to do is for those questions we don't get to is to send them to um, to Randy and Evan and, uh, for, for answering, if uh, maybe elect, uh, uh, you know through email or whatever. But a lot of good questions, and we, we are grateful for that. Can you talk about the differences between citizens and persons 
in the 14th Amendment? The, the, the most straightforward way to address that is to break down the clauses of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. It begins with a declaration that all persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the several states. So here we have, for the first time, there wasn't this in the 1788 Constitution, a definition of what a citizen is. We then have a provision that is directed specifically at and for the protection of citizens. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Then we have two clauses that don't just refer and don't just protect citizens, but protect all persons. Nor shall any state deprive any person of due process or law of law or to deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. So what you get is a distribution of rights between all citizens on the one hand and all persons on the other. But that distribution, the disparity between it isn't so dramatic as to leave people who are not citizens outside of the protection of the law, outlaws. The whole point of having a due process of law clause and the equal protection of the laws clause is to ensure that all people are protected from the most basic and brutal forms of state or private violence, the kind of protection that was so often lacking uh, during Reconstruction and during the antebellum period. Uh, there's a request to talk more about the slaughterhouse cases. Uh, if we can, I, I know, Randy, you've given an entire lecture on that. <laughs> so uh, maybe just briefly uh, uh, summarize those because there are a few, a couple other questions I really would like to get to during this program. And then, as I say, uh, we'll send you the other questions that we don't get to for perhaps a follow up later. Well, let me, let me first uh, suggest that people, um, uh, look at this, my article, my lecture at the Supreme Court Historical Society, which was published in the Journal of Supreme Court History, uh, called The Three Narratives of Slaughterhouse, because it's all about the actual case. Uh, for our purposes, um, what's, what's important um, is that in the Slaughterhouse case, the Slaughterhouse cases involve um, uh, white uh, male butchers uh, in Louisiana, in New Orleans, who were contesting the constitutionality of a Slaughterhouse Act which created a monopoly on slaughterhouse provisions. That meant they, in order for them to engage in their trade, they had to go to a centralized uh, monop private company that where all the slaughtering would take place. This was first and foremost a health measure. Uh, and there were a lot of other regulations that were enacted as part of the Slaughterhouse Act, which were not even challenged. Uh, but the question was, did this infringe on the right or privilege of these white butchers um, uh, to engage in, in a lawful trade or occupation, which is the trade of being a butcher. Uh, and whether or not the monopoly slaughterhouse did or did not infringe upon that right, the court never reached that issue because what they held instead is that there was no such right. There was no such privilege or immunity to pursue a lawful occupation. The very next day, in a case equally that should be equally infamous, which is a case called Bradwell versus Illinois, um, that case involved a woman who was denied the right to practice law in Illinois because she was a woman. And she challenged this as a violation of her privileges or immunities of citizens. And the court the day after Slaughterhouse said, well, if everything we said yesterday was true, and that is that there really is no privilege of citizenship to pursue a lawful occupation, then this case is an easy case. And we don't even have to discuss whether it's reasonable or unreasonable to, pre to prevent a woman from practicing law because there is no constitutional right to practice law that's protected by the by, from the uh, that's protected by the federal government against the states. We believe uh, from when, and it was from that day until this day that the privileges or immunities clause of the Constitution was rendered nullity uh, by the case, whereby simply saying uh, that the only so what did the court hold? The court held that the only privileges or immunities of citizens in the United States were those privileges that were created by the U.S. Constitution, not recognized by it, but created by it. 
Well, you say, what about the First Amendment? That's in the U.S. Constitution. Freedom of speech is in the U.S. Constitution. Yeah, but the court said, but those rights are natural rights. They pre-exist the creation of the Constitution. They are not the preceding creation of the Constitution. Therefore, your First Amendment rights, your Second Amendment rights, your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, they are not, they are not privileges or immunities of national citizenship. This was, this was an egregiously wrong uh, decision about which most all constitutional scholars agree was wrongly decided. Now, not all constitutional scholars agree what, what the correct interpretation of the privilege of immunity clause is. That's what our book is about. But there is a general academic consensus that whatever its meaning is, it was not the meaning that was adopted by the Supreme Court in Slaughterhouse cases. Thank you. I think we've uh, provided a link to that, uh, to that lecture also on, on screen. Um, originalism is often associated with political conservatism these days. What is the political liberal case for originalism? I think the best case, political liberal case for originalism is a belief that the constitution is our law and that every woman, including all constitutional actors, take an oath to uphold our law. And that oath would mean nothing if the law that are, they're supposed to uphold is really up to them to decide what it is. They have to be bound by law. In other words, the Constitution is not the law that governs us. The Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. And those who govern us take an oath to follow that Constitution. They then make laws that we have to follow. But they have to follow that law. And that means that the Constitution must have a meaning that's independent of those people who take an oath to follow it, just like the speed limits have a meaning independent of those of us who have to follow the speed limits that are imposed on us, perhaps unreasonably. So the first reason for a progressive uh, to be an originalist is because they believe that there is a higher law of the Constitution and that the meaning of that, of that law cannot be changed unless it's changed properly and judges are not empowered to think. But there's another reason that, um, that might even be, a, or at least a motivation for progressives to follow the constitution. And that is to ask themselves this, uh, would, do they really want conservative judges and justices to be living constitutionalists? That I think they want to be living constitutionalists themselves, but do they really want people with whom they disagree politically to be able to amend the Constitution in ways that they prefer. So I think most uh, progressives would be very uncomfortable with conservative judges being living constitutionalists. And that means there's something wrong with living constitutionalism that judges can decide upon, at least on all on their own. Did, did John Bingham, the, the drafter of the 14th Amendment, advocate for the Bill of Rights to the states? Uh, did the uh, originalists consider that? I'm going to let Evan take this one. John Bingham is by any measure the primary drafter of what eventually became the 14th Amendment. The question of what his influence and his thoughts um, about what he was doing, the significance of what he was doing, uh, informs the original meaning of the amendments from the perspective of modern originalism and particularly from public media originalism really turns on just how many other people uh, knew what he said and he said it in terms that they understood and appreciated and communicated. Bingham is, as anyone who has spent any significant time with Bingham can probably attest, uh, notoriously difficult to parse at many points. And he appears to have held an idiosyncratic, by modern standards, understanding of just what the Bill of Rights is. Um, it wasn't idiosyncratic at the time. Many other Republicans also didn't think that the Bill of Rights referred to just the first through eighth and maybe the ninth and tenth amendments. Um, but looking at his statements now and seeing lots of references to the Bill of Rights, um, threatens, to, threatens to import modern ideas of what Bill of Rights is into our constitutional history in a way that we're, that we're pretty careful to try to resist. 
Bingham is without question, and the other thing about Bingham is that he demonstrably changes his position at a couple of points about just what his handiwork meant. People point to, I mean, the most explicit Bingham uh, incorporation and nothing but theory of the 14th Amendment comes out several years after the 14th Amendment is ratified. And after the case has been made to the public in particular terms, the testimony by a single person that, well, actually, it means something very discreet, very specific, a lot less messy than what was going on in the campaign trail, we apply an appropriate level of discount to that. Bingham is super important. The Bill of Rights are, or the provisions of the Bill of Rights are applied to the states, but that's not all that states are forbidden to violate. Do you provide a, a definition of public accommodation in the book? I think we do. Do we? Uh, we do not. We uh, we do discuss the history of the uh, the regulation of common carriers and the existence of um, uh, and the uh, the law governing and politics governing the treatments of monopolistic or quasi monopolistic entities and make some comments about the the scope of those of the of those concepts in ways that bear upon contemporary questions. Um, but the, you know, the reason that we don't provide a straightforward definition of public accommodations is because these terms were very much in flux and contested at the time. We do our best to provide a conceptual scheme that will enable readers to make our way, their way through um, a very messy and complicated history in which people are debating the meaning and the extension of a lot of different terms. Um, but our account doesn't carve the social world at the joints because doing so would actually undermine our project of trying to be as faithful to the history as we possibly can, even when it gets really messy. Here's the, I think here's the important thing that we do emphasize in the book that we, we need to think a lot harder about, I need to think a lot harder about, and that is that we're accustomed to thinking of what's called the public-private distinction. So on the public side is the government. On the private side are private enterprises or non-governmental agents. But in fact, at this period of time, there were at least three categories, not two. There was the public governmental for sure, and then there was the private non-governmental for sure. But in the middle was a category of public non-governmental. That is That has gone by various names, common carriers, in, Places of public accommodation. After the 14th Amendment, they were called businesses affected with the public interest. There was this middle ground. Now, this middle ground is highly under theorized today. So, exactly, that's why we don't have a neat definition. It was under theorized then as well. But there's absolutely no doubt in our minds, and we think the evidence shows, that this middle ground was thought to exist. And in wherever, however, this middle ground is defined, within that middle ground, American citizens were entitled to be free of arbitrary discrimination with respect to the provision of those goods and services in that middle ground. That was what the Civil Rights Act of 1875 barred, and eventually it's what became barred by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, I, we have, this can, we could go on, I, I assure you, and the list of questions that we're getting um, uh, could take us through the afternoon, I think, but uh, we're trying to, do this at least for on East Coast time over everyone's lunch hour, and and so we'll try to stick to those times. I'll give you one last question, and then as I say, we'll try to get answers to the others uh, in, in a different forum. Um, is there a realistic path for breathing new life into the privileges and immunity immunities clause? Well, our best shot was in the 2010 case of uh, uh, Heller versus, I mean, um, McDonald versus City of Chicago, um, when it was the right to keep and bear arms. And at that point, only one justice, Justice o Thomas, based his vote entirely on the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and the eight other justices, four progressives and four conservatives, refused to do that. Uh, that was our best shot. We had another shot with the Excessive Fines Clause that was found to be incorporated by the court into the due process clause in the Hibbs case, um, last term or the term before. Um, and that was another opportunity that could have been used. We're running out of opportunities. Here's the thing. 
I think this the privilege of immunities clause is never going to be revived until justices and judges are convinced that it has a definitive enough meaning to be put into effect without opening the Pandora's box of unlimited judicial governance and judicial supremacy over the whole country. That judges will not be simply making up whatever rights they think are important and claiming those are privileges or immunities of citizenship. In other words, until people are convinced there is a definitive original meaning of the privileges or immunities clause, um, uh, it, it stands no chance of being revived. This is what we hope to have accomplished in our book. This is, there's not that much you can accomplish in a book, but one of the things we hope you can accomplish in a book is establishing to the satisfaction of legal thinkers, both professors and judges, that the Privileges or Immunities Clause and the rest of the 14th Amendment has a definitive original meaning that is not overly threatening to popular governments and, and the idea of democratic uh, uh, governance in the United States. Judge Robert Bork described the Privileges or Immunities Clause as an ink blot. Justice Antonin Scalia described it as a Pandora's box. Our book is dedicated to the proposition that it is neither. It is neither unknown, and we should be a lot less scared of it than uh, the late Justice Scalia was, and many conservatives are because they are concerned that it will just invite judges to make up rights willy nilly. Um, the fabric of our law that's been developed under the auspices of the due process of law clause is, in many respects, exactly what you would get out of the privileges or immunities clause. There are some things that are missing. They are important, and our framework provides a roadmap to anybody who wants to use it to make our way back to the initial promise of the 14th Amendment's most pivotal clause. Well, thank you both very much. And uh, I, I particularly want to thank you and add to your, your, your own summary of what, what this book seeks to accomplish. And what I think you've done at the outset, uh, and it's clear, I think, with the book, too, is to illuminate for the public the proper mechanisms that exist under our Constitution for amendment and change. And that that the, our constitutional framework provides uh, opportunities through amendment uh, for change for the better, and uh, that's the proper course. Uh, I think it's a message that we really have to um, uh, voice uh, uh, it, it, today, especially in the environment we're in, the politically heated environment we're in, that there are uh, that the constitution works and and the amendment process works uh, when applied properly. <laughs> so thank you both very much for that. Um, I want to hold up your book uh, to uh, tell everyone about it. It's the signed copies of the book uh, are available from the Society's gift shop. It's the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. It's letter and spirit, Randy Barnett, Evan Burnick. Uh, we're very grateful for your uh, joining us today and uh, uh, these sessions have become very popular and we're happy for that. We have uh, two more events scheduled for 2021. Next Wednesday, November 17th, we are hosting along with the Georgetown Center for the Constitution and Professor Barnett, a lecture on Governor Morris uh, by uh, Dean uh, Bill Trainer. And uh, it is uh, our first in-person event since the pandemic began. There's also a live stream option for that one. Uh, we want to uh, encourage you to visit the Society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org for more details and to register for either option. Uh, on December 8th at noon, we will host uh, Professor Helen Knowles discussing her book, making minimum wage uh, over Zoom. This will be a Zoom meeting. Registration can be found at the Society's website as well. And I want to remind uh, our listeners that our uh, survey will go out later this evening to everyone who registered in advance. Uh, please do respond to it. We want to make these programs as rich and accessible to as many people as possible. This is one of the uh, you know, the, there's a, a silver lining in every cloud. And during the pandemic, uh, we've done more of these virtual lectures. And it's been uh, great, I think, for our members. 
uh, with, it's enabled us to expand beyond the, uh, the in-person meetings that we've been having. And uh, so we plan to continue to do that uh, in the future, even after the pandemic subsides. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you both Randy and Evan uh, for an enlightening discussion. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jim. We are adjourned.